Chapter 27 Forget not the tyranny of this wall, horrid place, nor the love of freedom that made it fall. Written on the Berlin Wall after it came down. A small package arrived the next morning from the post. It was labeled for me and had a return address and writing on it that I didn't recognize. The package was marked as seeds. Who would be sending us seeds? Fritz asked. The package had been opened already and the Stasi inspection stamp was on the outside, but it didn't look like they'd gone through it with anything more than a cursory examination. Seven envelopes of seeds were inside, all of them for squash. Squash, Fritz wrinkled his nose. Who would ever want so much squash? Popplewood, I replied. It was his favorite vegetable. Fritz sat beside me. Did this package come from... Then he remembered we were bugged and changed his question. From anyone we know? For the benefit of the microphones, I said, I sent away for some seeds to help with the garden. Then I poured the envelopes out on the table. Fritz and I tore each one, but each contained only seeds. I felt beyond disappointed. Surely this package had come from my father, but I had expected more from him. When I said we needed money to help with gardening, he should have read more into this than note. We didn't need seeds, and certainly not this many seeds for squash, or worse. Maybe he did send money, and the Stasi had inspected it straight out of the package. Frustrated, I picked up the wrapping to crumble it from the garbage, and then something rattled inside. I opened it again, and saw one more package of seeds that had stuck in the seal. I pulled it out and made some comment about it being even more stupid squash seeds. But this envelope was different. It still rattled with seeds inside, but not as easily, and it was thicker than the others. I opened it and saw it was stuffed with Ostmarks. I wasn't sure how much was in there, but probably more than we would spend in a month. My eyes filled with tears and Fritz's too, but he shook them away and in a cheery voice said, Well, I suppose we're planting squash then. That was smart, Gerda, to write and ask for those seeds. By late fall, we'll have plenty of food for as many people as might want it. As we walked to the welcome building that morning, Fritz and I discussed what we should do with the money. I wanted to buy enough food to stock our cupboards again, but Fritz felt we ought to have a wheelbarrow to haul the dirt. The buckets don't carry enough dirt with each load. It takes too many trips in and out of the building, which is dangerous. A wheelbarrow would be better. Papa sent that money for food, I protested. We were living on so little these days that lately my hunger won out in any argument. No, he sent that money for us, and we need a wheelbarrow more than we need cheese and sausage. I disagreed. I'd rather have bought a hundred fat sausages with it, or better yet, a fine yellow banana from the black market. I carried my hunger everywhere with me even into my dreams lately. Mama had said there was a lot of starvation at the end of the Second World War, but I never really understood what that meant, not until the last few days. Now, every time my stomach rumbled and I had nothing to comfort it, I understood why she was worried about having enough food. In the end, Fritz won the argument and we bought a small wheelbarrow. On our way there, I'd have still rather had the banana. At least it made me hauling the dirt easier. While he dug, I used the bucket to empty from the basement into the wheelbarrow outside, all bl blocked from the view of the watchtower. Then I put another sheet on top and walked it over to the pond. With fewer trips, I was removing far more dirt than ever before. For much of the day, though, Fritz weeded and planted Papa seeds while I continued removing dirt. It was slowed down our work in the tunnel, but if the guards were watching from their tower, they needed to see progress in this garden every day. Late that afternoon, I was on my way to the pond with another load of dirt covered over with two sheets from my bed when a green turbant kabul with the word Volpoxi drove up. Two police officers were inside. 
I froze in place while Fritz, his head shot up and he jumped to his feet. I looked at him. Should we run? Where would we possibly go? Keep working. Fritz's voice was terse. Wait until they're not looking, then empty the wheelbarrow. But let them see you wash the sheep. Just pretend that everything is normal. We're gardening. That's all. I put my head down and continued walking toward the pond. I suddenly felt exposed, like spotlights were pointing down on me, revealing to the world every secret I'd ever tried to hide. The secret right in front of me. Why did a girl need a wheelbarrow to haul only two sheets? Why did her muscles strain if the load was only lightweight cotton? Why did she insist on cleaning in the pond that sent the sheets out dirtier than when they went in? The two officers left their car fully armed and surveyed the lot like they already knew we were up to something. Truly, how could they miss the glaring signs of what we were really doing here? For as careful as we thought we had been, it all looked so obvious to me now. Fritz hailed the officers and walked out to meet them as far from the pond as possible. He invited them over to inspect our garden patch and brought them with him to the opposite side of the clothesline, leaving me free to quickly dump the wheelbarrow full of dirt. I plopped into the water far too loudly, and soon I heard the footsteps of one of the officers coming my way. Guten Tag! I saw white blonde hair and immediately recognized the officer as the one who had put his rifle against my cheek several weeks ago. Mueller. The same rifle was still slung over his shoulders, but he also carried a sidearm pistol on his right hip. He had frightened me then, and much as I wanted to hide my fear this time, my legs were already shaking. Guten Tag, I answered. My tone wasn't rude, but it wasn't friendly either. I know you, he said. You're the girl who watches the wall on her way to school. It's hard to miss the wall, sir. He chuckled, but only for a brief moment. Perhaps. But there are some who glance at the wall and others who seem to study it. I had no way to answer that, and I panicked for a moment. My eyes darted over to Fritz, wishing he were here to help me. But Officer Mueller didn't seem to notice and only turned to face the garden. We came to have a look at your Schrebergarten, to see your progress on this land. We planted squash and corn this week. I said. June is too late for planting. Nothing will grow by the time the frost returns. It took us longer than we thought to clear the ground, sir. I kept my head down, always at work washing the sheet in my hands. Yes, we expected to see more than this. Mueller started to walk away, and I leapt from the pond to follow him. Fritz was already showing the other officer around the field, but there wasn't much to see. I worried that Mueller might get bored and wander to investigate the building. The window we used to get inside was closed and looked as if it was nailed up just like the others, but of course it wasn't. A firm push would open it and reveal our two-faced plan. Are you a gardener? I asked, following behind him. Maybe you can give us some advice. How long do you spend in this garden each day? He ignored my question, which meant he had no interest in polite conversation, and he was walking directly toward the welcome building. It varies. Often in the heat of the day, we rest in the shade. You are working this ground on behalf of the state, not for your own pleasure, Mueller said. If you are uncomfortable on warm days, we can find others who want the work. Uh, the state isn't paying us to be here, sir, I said, only allowing us the use of the land. He turned to me. The state does not need to pay you. You will expect some of this harvest, I assume. That is your pay. I lowered my head and held a tone of humility. Yes, sir. I'd have thrown in a hundred more sirs if it helped. While Mueller marched on, still walking toward the building, I glanced back at Fritz for assistance. What was I supposed to do if Mueller tried to get inside? But Fritz couldn't do anything to help. He was showing the other officer our permit for the land and answering whatever questions came at him. 
It was up to me to keep Mueller away from the building. But how could I? Mueller wasn't tall enough to see into the long upper windows, and like Fritz, he had to crouch to be low enough for the three windows at the ground level. He stopped at the first window, one that was actually boarded up at least. He pulled out his flashlight and shone it through the cracks in the wood. Luckily, Fritz had filled in the largest gaps with extra wood and had gotten rid of most of the dirt that had been in there. The metal door for the air raid shelter was closed and covered in a scruff of dirt, so he shouldn't be able to see it, and Fritz's pulley system was laid on its end in the far corner of the room. With only a flashlight, I doubted Mueller could see anything more than some fallen boards. Do you ever go in here? Mueller asked me. It doesn't look safe to enter, I said. The building is old and probably was bombed at one point. It looks like the whole thing might collapse soon. Actually, I didn't worry a bit about that happening, but I hoped he would believe it might collapse on him and decided to stay out. Are there any doors to get inside? I shrugged. We are at the back of the building. The front would be on the other side of that wall. Perhaps you could assess a door there if you're allowed. Of course I'm allowed, he snapped. But the entrance on that end is bricked over. What's your name? If I thought there was any chance to get away with it, I'd have lied to him. But it was too easy to check my story. Girdle low, sir. I'm twelve years old and live about five blocks away with my mother and brother. Does your mother approve of your gardening? She doesn't know. She's out of town caring for my grandmother. We hoped to make this garden a surprise for her when she comes home. He arched an eyebrow. Girdle low. Is your father Aldous Lowe? I've seen his file. I hesitated. What else could I do but answer? Yes, sir, but he lives in the West. We have no contact with him anymore. As soon as I said it, I could have kicked myself for the lie. Only that morning, we had received Papa's package. If Mueller checked my story, he would return with more questions. Or more officers. Your father did not believe in communism. He felt that it was only a matter of time before the GDR collapsed. You'd have to ask my father about his belief, sir. I was very young when he left. Except, of course, that he had taught me everything he believed. Mueller stared down at me and I felt like squirming beneath his gaze. Only twelve years old? You seem older. With my father in the West and my mother work, or with my grandmother... I've had to grow up fast. Hmm. Mueller's attention returned to the building. So is there a way inside here or not? I flicked my eyes to the window we used, but I quickly looked anywhere else. We wouldn't know, sir. Mueller walked down and leaned over to tap on the middle window. Then he took another step toward the third, the one that Fritz and I used. Once he pushed it, he would know. He would see what we were doing, and if I tried to stop him, that would only make things worse. I could try to run, but wouldn't get more than a few steps away before he'd draw his gun. Officer Mueller, his companion called. We just got a call to investigate something further down. It's probably a bird caught in the wires again, but we need to check it out. Yes, sir, Mueller called back. I hope the next time you come, we'll have corn and squash to offer you. He must have detected the fake cheerfulness in my voice. Mueller stared at me again. Was my face as flush as it felt? I could hardly keep two thoughts together, and there was so much sweat on my palms that if I brushed them against my clothes, I knew it would leave marks. He frowned at me, then walked on and tapped on the third window with the butt of his rifle. Mueller had pushed at the side of the window with the hinges attached. It knocked the boards open only by a hair, but they did open, and I was sure if I, not if I noticed, he must have too. Officer Mueller, his companion called again, more sternly this time. If Mueller had crouched there like he did for the others, he might have seen the boards separated from the wall. But instead, he told me to stay ready, the slogan for all young people and walked away. A minute later, his vehicle vanished down the road. I collapsed onto the dirt, so full of fear that I could scarcely breathe. 
Fritz came over and knelt beside me. Are you all right? No. I was fighting back hysterics. He was right here, Fritz. Another second. One more step. Just breathe. Fritz put a hand on my back and rubbed it. Take some breaths, Gerda. We're all right. But I couldn't get enough air. All I wanted was to yell loud enough to get the fear out of my body. He had to know something was wrong. Our story doesn't make sense. There are too many holes, too much that doesn't come together. But they did believe it, and they did go away. And we knew they'd come at some point, and now they're gone. It's over. It's not over, Fritz. Down to my bones, I knew it wasn't over. There would be more visits and more questions, harder questions designed to trap us, ones we couldn't answer. This would never be over. My question at the end of chapter 27. Who came to see them at the welcome building? Why was this a bad thing? <laughs>